It's my pleasure to introduce Doreen Janey from NASA, who is going to talk to us about GPM and share some of the resources that are new. Uh, right. And can yeah. you guys hear me okay? Can yeah. Okay, good. We can hear and see everything is fine. Oh, my goodness. Yes. <laughs> so what I'm going to be sharing with you um, are a series of, of new lesson plans that um, Dahlia Kirschbaum, the scientist whom I support with GPM, had asked if I would put together. What we're trying to do is to feature and focus on the real world applications of the mission um, you know, versus how it works and, and you know, why we're measuring precipitation from space and that sort of thing. What I would really love from this group, as you look at these, because these are brand new, um, I want to put them through product review eventually, but I'd really like to get your input. If you can think of some ways in which um, we might uh, align this and, and add some GLOBE aspect to it, I, I want to make sure that, that teachers who aren't in the GLOBE program don't feel uninvited, but certainly I think there's going to be ways, particularly with Extend um, and some other opportunities you may see to add oops to add a um you know more of a globe component i'm also super excited because as i was working on this um in another context i started to talk with angie who's on here and then also elizabeth and they told me about the um my nasa data uh, data literacy cubes that they had and i was able to integrate those into this lesson and um i'm, I'm super excited about that too because i think that is really going to help with unpacking the data. So to see this, the, the, these, any of the lessons that we have through um, the GPM mission, we call them uh, precipitation education. And we have lots of um, lessons here, many of which are GPM originals, but we also put in good, good ideas and activities from other sites. I know that Angie and Elizabeth gave me a bunch of really good ones from my NASA data. And my big focus was on getting these finished for Earth Day. So now that they're finished, I have a little more bandwidth and I will start working on adding those. Um, I didn't forget, I just, my, my disc was full. So um, these fall under, we have, we have four basic realms when we're looking at um, ways in which to share the science technology and applications for the GPM mission. And the ones that we pulled out were water cycle, weather and climate, technology, and societal applications. So of course, these lesson plans are all going to fall under the societal applications. So what we were looking at with this is we were looking at um, the gentleman in the brown there is a guy named Faisal Hussein. He's a civil engineering professor, um, and he is using GPM data to be able to help farmers in Pakistan be able to um, use just really inexpensive cell phones that get text messages so that they know whether or not they need to flood or irrigate their field with their very, very precious freshwater resources, or if they can wait until you know it rains. So um, it has apparently been extremely successful um, working with people in, in uh, Pakistan, and now they're also broadening it to work in India and a couple of other countries over in Southeast Asia as well. So what I wanted to do was to pull together an activity that's a project-based approach, where I have students learning um, information in different expert groups. So they're learning different types of information. One group is learning about growing wheat, another one about the differences in weather and climate, another group, oh, oh weather and climate in Kansas, which is a major wheat growing location, and in Pakistan in a town that's a major wheat growing location. And then learning about the scarcity of freshwater resources in Pakistan. Um, we also have a video. Now, the video didn't come out until I was done with the lesson plans because everybody was on a, on a tight schedule. Now that the video has come out, I need to go back and add it to the lesson plans. My thought, though, but I'd love to have your opinion after you get a chance to see the lesson plans. My thought is that I wouldn't show the video to the kids until after they had worked in their expert groups because part of what I want them to do is to not have that complete picture, to work in their individual expert groups, then come together, 
pool their resources and their ideas and understanding, and then we'll take them to helping them learn how technology can be used to decrease the amount of valuable freshwater resources that they're needing to use um, to irrigate their wheat crops in Pakistan. Each of the lesson plans, regardless of the grade level, have a teacher's guide. Once you go into the teacher's guide, it has a slide set that you download. The slide set I keep in PowerPoint so that that way if teachers want to add or take away information, they can. They don't have to have it as a static product. Um, so there's a teacher's guide that also tells them which slide to go to, it gives lots and lots of information. And it is in there that you'll find out about the um, data literacy cubes and how to use them and get more information about how long the lesson plan will take, yada, yada, yada. There's also a rubric in this, for this particular series of lesson plans, what I decided was that teachers can choose on their own if they want to do pre-assessments and post-assessments and go into a whole lot more, um, have a lot more focused effort on the content. What I decided to focus on was having the students give some sort of a presentation. So kind of having it as a universal design for learning where their presentation could be a brochure or a skit or a song or you know a video. It could, it could be whatever the teacher decides is most appropriate for those students in that that um, and and her, and his or her classroom. So that's what the rubric is: um, growing wheat, freshwater availability, weather and climate in gypsum, and weather and climate in Sargadha. All of those are um, expert guides. They'd be best if the students are to read them on computers because some of them have hyperlinks which have them see a few short videos or maybe go learn a little more about a farmer that sort of thing. And all of these are also scaffolded. So at the third grade level, the reading information is much easier than say at the high school level. Um, then they've got a note taking organizer. I'll show you that in a little bit. Um, they have interviews there. We have both a video interview that talks about a very, very short interview about their STEM field and why they went into their career. Um, on here, you just see Faisal because it wasn't until the secondary level plans that I decided to add Iker Ibaras, who is a um, insurance person. And that also is kind of interesting um, to understand how and why you would include insurers or insurers would be using GPM data. All right, so here I'm not going to read all these to you, but I just want to show you for each of those different grade levels, and this is why there are grade levels that it's aligned to, I pulled some of the next generation um, science standards that I was going to highlight as I did these lesson plans. So at the third grade level, um, they're working here and starting to look at data to understand weather conditions and understand climates. By the time they get into the fifth grade level, they're looking at the interaction between spheres. I'm interested in looking at and graphing the amounts and percentages of water that's on earth and so on and so forth. Middle school, we get into things like a lot more complexity when we're looking at weather, um, you know, understanding basically how the atmosphere works, interpreting data on um, natural hazards. And then here we're also starting to get into more of the specificity of um, how and why you might have people like the insurers be able to help out with some of these um, real world problems. And then again, we get into a lot more detail here. And up here, I was even able to pull out, we, we have in, in middle school, you're starting to look at photosynthesis. And here you're also looking at um, cellular respiration. So it was really fun to be able to take that specific information and pull it into those expert guides. For the um, third and fifth grade, they've got kind of an easier, more, um, I don't know, kid-friendly note taker organizer to work with. And then um, for the uh, older students, they have one that looks a little more like it's for older students. This, I'm not gonna spend much time on. Again, you can you know, take a look at it online. But for each of these grade levels, we've got the growing wheat, weather and climate, uh, and that one's in gypsum, this is in Sargadha, and then talking about the freshwater resources. This is the part that I really wanted them to be able to do, but I wanted them to do this with some understanding, but also 
um, knowing that this data is extremely challenging to kind of look at initially and then unpack. This is where the use of the MyNASA, MyNASA data um, graph cubes will really, really come in handy. Um, I have some students right now that I'm doing a virtual learning uh, with, um, virtual teaching with. Um, they're all the seventh graders in um, Mamamoy um, Middle School on the Cape in Massachusetts. And so I'm taking them through these lessons. We haven't gotten here yet, but when we do, I'm gonna send them in advance and they can uh, make the data literacy cubes. So basically what they're doing here is they have a couple of questions. They are getting together in their expert groups and they're having to look and unpack this data. This is for Pakistan and this is for Gypsum, Kansas. And they need to try to decide in which of these areas are farmers going to need to, um, in addition to counting on, uh, well, uh, to irrigate in, uh, in addition to counting on precipitation to be able to water their wheat crops during the wheat growing season. So they have to kind of rely on each other, talk about weather and climate. Um, the ones who do growing wheat know about what the environmental um, parameters are for growing wheat. And the ones who know about the weather and climate will know, you know when to expect certain types of weather. Plus they'll look at this to know about the um, precipitation. And then the ones who have fresh water, uh, uh, the lack of fresh water availability in Pakistan will also be able to report in in a little more detail about how that irrigation works and what they need to consider there. And then, like I say, we include information on um, these two different um, people who are involved in a kind of an unusual STEM career, something you wouldn't normally think of. They're not just your average run of the mill scientist or, um, or engineer. So we've got our Faisal Hussein, and the video that we have, that longer video focuses on him. And then he did a short two minute video, which is inside the PowerPoint. And the same with Iker Ibaras. Uh, but again, for him, his, uh, power, his um, video and um, uh, doesn't show up until the secondary level. And then we will uh, be releasing pretty soon as when Ryan gets it out there, like a three to four minute video explaining how and why this microinsurance is used to help sustainability for people in, you know, in, in developing countries or, or even people who have small business operations, small farmers, artists who um, you know, need to rely on a less expensive product to be able to help them in case of extremes and precipitation. And um, here you can find all of those um, articles that I was talking about and all of the different lesson plans and the videos. So I'm gonna stop there and I will take questions if people have. I'm gonna stop my sharing so I can actually see things again. Cool. Well, thank you, thank you. I'm, um, put the link in the chat, sure. I'm operating in this case with one computer. I'm used to having two monitor. I have one computer and one monitor because I had to go on a different computer. Let me find that and stick that up here. I think I just did that during oh, the right. TPM.net. Thank you, darling. Cool. And I'll also put my email on here. Anyone feel free to reach out if you know you have questions, if you um, you know have suggestions, ideas. Uh, you know, just I, I'm I'm just so excited about getting input from people. And and um, this is the first of a series of probably a, a series of three different types of lessons. The next one is gonna be focusing on the Navajo Nation and the ways in which the end users are using our data to um, help them deal with drought conditions that, that they are experiencing there. And then I'm trying to think of another one we're working with probably numerical weather predictions. But again, we're taking unusual end users and then really working to focus on those real world applications and then also how can we get kids to get in there and work with the data and kind of understand it? Jen, that is the coolest background ever. Minecraft, that is way cool. Oh. That would be Star Wars. Star Wars, love it. Yeah. Um, does each grade level, so the way that I did it, Tracy, is that um, within each grade level, there are different next-gen science standards. And so within the PowerPoint presentation and some of the different 
resources that I suggest that the teacher uses or that I put into the expert guides, those are gonna be focusing on, on different aspects of, uh, of the next gen science standards. The overall ask is the same, whether they're third graders or whether they're 12th graders, they're still gonna look at that comparison between the GPM uh, data for um, uh, Pakistan and for Kansas because that was kind of what I want them to get into and do is, is, is mess with that kind of messy data and come away with some analysis and understanding of it. Um, so that overall task is the same. And um, the way in the, the type of data is scaffolded and, and not just the type of data, the, the, uh, not data, the type of information, the content they're dealing with is scaffolded based on their cognitive level and also based on what were some of the key next generation science standards that just kind of called out to me to be able to be applicable in, in you know, this type of a lesson plan. Yeah, and I like the faces of GPN, that's pretty cool. Yeah, and that, that you know, Svetlana, we, th we think that's super important. Um, I like the engineer one, because we also feature some um, non-traditional engineers and African-American and, and women engineers. Um, of course, our, our you know, Dahlia is just fantastic. So, you know, for, for our, our scientists, that, uh, that, that's cool too. In this case, though, we're trying to reach out and take people that actually aren't GPM people, but who are using our data and kind of, you know, highlight and tell their story. So it's kind of an interesting twist on what we've done before. Oh, please. Uh, yep. Go ahead, Ann. Hi. Um, thanks, uh, Dorian. This is like really amazing and exciting and inspiring. Um, I'm trying to think about how I might integrate this into my professional development. And I know one of the questions being in South Dakota, being a wheat growing um, state is, is there a way we can switch Kansas for another community like using GLOW? I mean, what, what, where's the Kansas data coming from and can we use another state? Of course you can. And wouldn't that be such a cool way to continue to add on to this and maybe to even add that globe component? The reason I selected Kansas is in this case, because I also wanted kids to be looking at, at climate. Some of the, um, the fifth grade and when we get into the middle school, they're actually having to look at the, um, oh, I'm trying to think what the name of that is, the Vossen, the Hoffer something classification. So I was looking at where do we have um, local steppe climates that are in mid temperate regions that are also very well known for um, being, being, you know, be, being very well known for, for their wheat growing. Um, in the case of Sangram, I always get that wrong, Sangadha, that is a, a, not a very large city, but, but a huge population. Whereas when we're looking at Gypsum, Kansas, it's just like 400 people total, even with our farmers. Um, and then I learned so much about farmers when I just did the research for this, which I, I didn't know and was blown away. But I think you could take any kind of, you know, crop that's being grown. In this case, of course, we focused on wheat because that's what Faisal Hussein was working with. But sure, you know, take wheat or ask your students then. An extension could be, okay, now I want you to pick a crop that you eat on a regular basis or that, you know, interests you. And I want you to do this research. Find two um, places where it's grown, compare and contrast the climatic and weather conditions. A big thing I focus in these lessons too is to understand the difference between weather and climate. And that's at the third grade level. And I found some good videos that were, you know, like I think it's my NASA, my world or something, you know, NASA, that's easier. And then I actually found a good Coco Ross one that was kind of cooler for the high school and middle school kids. But sure, I think that's a great idea. And I have a quick question and a thank you. What a great presentation. I love it. It's just, uh, and generally, thanks to all of you. It's, you are my support <laughs> network. So I'm just really can't wait every Friday. And whenever you're not here, I'm just like, where, where is my community? <laughs> so anyway, I studied diplomacy with the United Nations and um, switch coming from engineering to education and having this affinity for data. Uh, this is my thing as well. So, um, but I was wondering if if there is an effort um, with uh, under the my NASA uh, uh, data 
uh, effort to connect uh, this with the uh, sustainable development goals and and with with the general um, the general um, notion that uh, uh, that students need to really understand uh, what what is actually the data that we can use uh, in formal or, uh, uh, inquiry and things of that nature because with all of this development around the world and concern about the false data and things of that nature so um, like United Nations put a lot of effort into um, the training on how to govern data uh, from the perspective of diplomatic efforts and, and sustainable development goals. I thought this link would be at least in some sort of, even on the surface, not really digging into PhD level of research, but uh, to, to make that connection, I think to, um, to make a distinct, really the difference between the data that you can um, trust and trust and verify. I don't know, I apologize. It's Friday afternoon and English is, is just really failing me. <laughs> Larissa, that's such a great, great suggestion. I've made myself a note and given it a asterisk. That means it's an action item. Then the next step will be to highlight. But um, especially for the middle school and high school level um, in their expert guide groups and even for, for um, the information I give the teachers, I would love to pull in and it will be easy enough to do the sustainable development goals I definitely have, if you look at the high school level, um, whether you're looking at the wheat growing or you're looking at the fresh water, I did pull in um, a lot of information from the, well, not a lot, but some information from the World Health Organization. And, you know, of course, I have to make sure that the sources that I'm using ha have been vetted, um, especially when it came to, you know, for example, trying to find out what types, varieties of wheat are being um, developed and sold in Pakistan. You know, it took multiple kind of getting in there and digging to pull that information out. So I love that idea. And I would pass that on to the my, our, my NASA data folks to maybe uh, offer up what they have done thus far. Cause I, I am, like I say, I just kind of stumbled into uh, seeing their rich resources and got super excited about including them. And then I asked permission. But it'd be neat to know if they do have any activities already created that are helping to do that with a focused intent to verify and validate, you know, unreliable data from real news from fake news. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for your great presentation. I always enjoy it. It's my honor. Love to be here with everyone. Hi, this is Angie on the, as far as the MyNASA data goes. I don't think we have any activities specifically designed for for that right now um but we have the data right so it it's certainly something that could be looked at as far as um looking at something and trying to see now most of our data are historical so it would depend on the claim being made right but uh, um we we've already been having some conversation around resources to even just help students look at are the data reasonable and I think that could help with that looking at the claims and evaluating them yeah that sounds great thank you Angie sure um, I just an additional quick thought and this is kind of a question to Lynn um, there was a connection being forged I thought between globe and the sustainable development goals of re-upping of the goals. I attended a meeting um, around the time of AGU, maybe four years ago, four or five years ago. Jill Carson was supposed to be there and she had apparently, I think, been that linchpin person between the two initiatives. I don't, I'm only bringing it up because I'm always thinking about what motivates students to do this work. And I never have fully understood, this is, goes us down another rabbit hole, but just to, to Um, I think it's always motivating for the students when they know that they're contributing to something, right? They're contributing to something bigger than themselves or their, even their, their communities. And um, I've never understood exactly how the sustainable development goals are supposed to be enacted and whether anybody's holding anybody accountable to meeting those goals. But uh, I would just putting a, a placeholder in for uh, a future conversation about that to see if there's any way that GLOBE can contribute 
uh, and um, I think that would be uh, just awesome for our students to know that they were somehow contributing to international monitoring tour of these major international and because everybody's awareness is heightened now about how we're all interconnected and how things are so messed up right now and development is more important than ever and so forth. So I don't know if uh, Lynn has any, I don't, I don't want to take us down a, a different path. But Yeah, I, um, I don't have a lot of information. I can say that there is a one pager on the GLOBE site that you can look for that is the alignment between GLOBE and the Sustainable De Development Goals. Um, that would really be, I think, a question for Tony. Uh, um, I don't know what the status of that activity is, but I do know that there's a one pager that kind of shows alignment between the two and i'm not sure which i think that's the most recent version of the sdgs but i'm not even totally sure about that so hey this this is gary um, um we we actually helped to develop uh the original center for for expertise in education for sustainable development in atlanta uh it is the regional hub uh for developing the uh, sdgs along with um, a bounty full of uh, stakeholders there. Um, uh, we work closely with, with, with Georgia Tech, uh, Georgia State, Kennesaw State College, Agnes Scott College, and, and HBCUs there to, to bring together a cohort of almost 100 people uh, to flush out, if you, if you would, an application, uh, which was accepted by, by the United Nations, and then, 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 then to put, put in place a governance structure, actual working organization now. And, and we're in our second iteration of that uh, so if anybody need, needs to know anything about the sustainable and and the, the, the breakfast fact uh, our organization won uh, the RCE's award this year for implementation of the sustainable of the sustainable development goals at the at the international level for development of our environmental justice Academy so if anybody needs to know anything about the sustainable development goals I have a source so just let me know. And sorry, who was that? Uh, I all voices are so beautiful, but sometimes it's difficult to figure out who's who's who talks. I'm the only guy on on the screen right now. <laughs> it's, oh. uh, so it's, scary. Right. it's scary. It's scary. Okay, thank you, Gary. Thank you. Not sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, it's a uh, so Gary Harris, and so is, uh, Larissa. We can definitely connect you. Um, I'll just add to that the recent collaboration between uh, all the regional RCOs um, that happened, the data collection uh, was based on the sustainable development goals, the water collaboration one that took place this fall, and there was going to be one in March as well. And that is led by Mark Bretney from South Africa. And all of it was really based around that. And UNEP uh, was involved in that effort, the scientists from UNEP, and they did actually uh, webinars with all the data and talking about the sustainable development goals. So those are all on the website. So we can make sure we put those as resources for this particular water cooler so that you can look into that and see those webinars. Um, and I know that Mike, uh, and we'll also put the link to the Sustainable Development Globe Crosswalk. And it sounds like, Mike, you've done some work around that with your science methods class. Um, yes, what I did is that. you can go in and look at the indicators that go with each of the goals that Globe's aligned to. And that's a lot. It, I mean, there's great ideas then. It, it just takes it from such a broad uh, sweeping goal down to um, as Svetlana asked, more measurable kinds of things. So it's pretty cool. Sure, excellent. Wow, that's fantastic. If those, if the links can be shared, whatever can be shared, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Okay. And then my- fact, we, I'm sorry, matter of fact, what we're having, we're showcasing GLOBE on the 13th of May. Uh, the, the, there was an actual project between uh, Janie, right? Was it you or or someone else? There was an actual project between between you and um, or in, anyway the the, the um, mosquito uh, group and the folks at Kennesaw State College and the folks at Emory University. They came together and through a youth consortium, 
uh, that they're going to be showcasing uh, SEG three or four, I believe it is, through quality education as it re as it relates to Globe. Uh, so that showcase is occurring uh, on uh, May thirteenth. Appreciate more information and link if possible if this is yeah. still ongoing. Thank you, Gary, and thank you, Mike, and thank you, Jen. Absolutely. So, Mike, can you also send us the link for Project Look Smart? It says you have a, they have a suite of media and data literacy activities. So if you could send that link to us too, we can add that to the resources uh, for this one and potentially for some of our other SRS things. Um, that would be great. Uh, okay, anything else for Dorian before we, I just have a couple things that I just wanna share very quickly. So any other questions for Dorian though? And I know she will be an awesome resource for us moving forward. And we'll make sure those links go with the water cooler recording. We're getting those up pretty quickly, Monday or Tuesday, usually of the next week. So people can uh, look into that. And, oh, and you had a question, when will we get trained in this so we can train teachers? Is that Dorian's materials? Because there's no training involved with that. Is that correct, Dorian? That's correct, yep. So go ahead and use it and hey, baby. go. <laughs> and when you use it, if you have suggestions, you know, it used to be so cool when I had the GPM master teachers of which Kristen was one and, you know, many other folks were because, and when I was teaching, because then we could try these things and pilot them, you know, before we kind of wrote them. And it's, it's kind of hard to do it with, you know, in a vacuum. So I'm happy to be doing this distance teaching of middle schoolers and using the curriculum, but, you know, definitely would love any, any, you know, guidance and, and, and feedback and, and, uh, things you see that I could have added or should have added that I didn't. So thank you. Thanks for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Sitting here among friends and being able to kind of, kind of share something. So thank you. All right. So the last few things is I hope everyone belongs to our Facebook page for the globe educators. Uh, let's see, let me just, um, share my screen. I think we might have to say no trivia today to be cognizant of everyone's time. If you want to stay on, we can do an individual quick game. I mean, there's only five questions and, you know, some of them are actually multiple choice this week. So we can probably get it done pretty quickly. Um, but I want to be cognizant of everyone's time. So, let's see, I'm going to just share my screen, and there's two things that I just wanted to tell you about. The first one is just reminding you about uh, the Student Research Symposia video in the 2020 STEM for All video showcase. I know a couple other GLOBE partners have presentations as well. So I'm gonna try and send out an email with everybody's presentations together, but uh, ours is here. And what's special I think about ours is our co-presenters are teachers and GLOBE partners that you may know and love, um, but also that are the teachers of the students that appear in the video. So for that, we have Elodie Bourbon and she's from Freeport High School in New York City. And then we have Sue Doherty, and she's in Connecticut. Uh, Rosalba is uh, from NASA, based in New York City as well, and she works with the School for the Deaf there. And then Tina Hart has been a reviewer for years, so she's going to be one of our co-presenters. And then Rick Sharp's student appears in, uh, from West Virginia, appears in that. So it's pretty exciting to me. We actually have three languages represented. We have English, Spanish, and ASL in the video. So it's pretty neat, I think, um, that we highlighted all the different um, languages that students have a tendency to speak so far at ours, um, except we did not, uh, and this is the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic uh, SRS. So I hope you check it out. and. 
you can actually vote and choose ours as a public choice. Not saying you have to, but you know, if you want to. Um, and then uh, just to highlight on our website, we have Dorian here speaking <laughs> from under an umbrella about precipitations, uh, precipitation. And then we have some other, David Paget posted this Girls Steam Ahead with NASA free resources. So there's a lot happening on this US Globe Program Educators page that I hope you check out.